Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Hannah. It's great to be here uh, with two uh, fantastic uh, writers. I feel very privileged to be to be sitting up here with them. Um, so the, we're, we're here tonight to uh, try and dissect the US presidential race. Um, November the 3rd, 2020, we will know who will be the next president of the United States. Uh, and all of that is taking place against the backdrop of an impeachment hearing. Um, it's quite possible that President Trump will be impeached and not found guilty in the Senate and will run and may possibly win, uh, which has never happened before, even though there have been two uh, impeachments in the modern era. I'm not counting Andrew Johnson in 1868, <laughs> but perhaps he'll come up. Um, it's also been a very big week, apart from the impeachment hearings, um, in Atlanta. Last night was uh, the fifth Democratic uh, Party debate, so we'll be talking about that too, with the two people sitting here on the platform with me. P.J. O'Rourke, author, journalist, and humorist, renowned for political satire. He is the author of 19 books, including Holidays in Hell and Republican Party Reptile. He's a, a, an occasional columnist for the Washington Post and is also, uh, also runs a web magazine called American Consequences. His book about the 2016 US presidential race, How the Hell Did This Happen?, was published in March 2017. There are books for sale after the event tonight. And Lionel Shriver, author of 12 novels, including the bestsellers The Mandibles, A Family, 2029 to 2047, and the Orange Prize winner, We Need to Talk About Kevin, which was, of course, also a 2011 feature film. She won the 2014 BBC National Short Story Award, and her novella and short story collection, Property, was published in 2018. She is, I'm sure you're all aware, a prolific journalist journalist whose writing has appeared in The Guardian, The New York Times, and she has a column in The Spectator. Welcome to you both. Do please join your hands together and welcome them. So given the polarized nature of um, politics in the United States, I wonder if it would help the audience if we get a steer from both of you to begin with. A, a, a short answer, I think, to begin with, where you stand politically. Lionel Shriver. Well, given the, that the United States has become so polarized, I don't fit in either camp. Um, I regard myself as a social liberal and a fiscal conservative. I'm one of the last great fiscal conservatives left in the United States. <laughs> um, and there is no party that represents my views. Uh, because I really don't have any choice, I am a registered Democrat. Uh, so, and uh, I've certainly never made any bones about the fact that um, I regard the Trump presidency as one of the great horrible accidents of, uh, in democrat democratic history. So, um, but it's, I'm constantly put into a difficult position because uh, the, most of the primary contenders for the democratic nomination are well to the left of me, uh, especially in, in relation to money matters. Um, like they want to spend a lot of it, mine. Um, and, and yet uh, the alternative is unthinkable. So I'm especially sympathetic with people who are not at all keen on Trump, but look at the array uh, that the Democrats now present and don't, don't easily recognize uh, the alternative that they're looking for. PJ. Well, I was a Republican, but I'm taking a few years off. <laughs> so, uh, I suppose really at heart I'm some, some sort of libertarian, you know, I, I kind of believe that, you know, mind your own business and keep your hands to yourself. I, I, I call these the Clinton rules. Uh, um, Hillary, mind your own business, Bill, keep your hands to yourself. You know, that's, that, that pretty much covers my, my political 
And I, too, regard Trump as an absolutely unmitigated disaster and a, and a great reminder, something we always have to keep in our heads about democracy is a simple mathematical fact. 50% of people are below average in intelligence. <laughs> I felt the need can't for a helped. pause there. <laughs> uh, can't be helped. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm afraid, PJ, sometimes it's 51. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yes, yes. Let's talk about, let's talk about what happened last night. You know, there were 10, there, were, there, are, there are now 10 who appeared in the debate last night. Um, and I think in the next primary debate, six have qualified. Who's your preferred candidate of the ones who oh, appeared last night? Oh, I was afraid you were going to ask me that. <laughs> um, I'm, like a, I, I'm like a lot of moderate Democratic voters in that, by default, I end up uh, supporting Biden without any enthusiasm. I mean, I, I'm a, a walking cliche. Uh, <laughs> I don't have any faith in Biden to go the distance. Uh, his performance last night was described by a number of commentators as, as better than usual. Oh my God. <laughs> And, you know, he, weirdly, he has a lot of the same problems that Trump does. He can't finish a sentence. He interrupts himself. <laughs> he has this freakish um, habit of being in the middle of the sentence and then saying, anyway. <laughs> it's like a little brain fart. And, you know, and I, 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 I will share, I, I believe that Trump is suffering from serious cognitive decline. It's not just that he's evil, it's that he's increasingly a little bit out of his mind, in, like a lot. And, and actually Biden has some of these same qualities. So I just, it, he just keeps up with the gaffes and it's become a bit of a joke, all, all the things he gets wrong and uh, he keeps referring to 1970 as if it were yesterday. Um, As do I, don't I. Th I don't think he's going to make it. So, I mean, then there's... When you say you don't think he's going to make it... I don't think he's going to make it to... to the bathroom. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, that was mean. <laughs> I'm, I'm 72 years old, and I get to say things like that. You know? Because I look at the poor guy, and I think... All the th all, everything you said, everything you said, and I think, yeah, ooh, me too, you know? I mean, I came into this room, I came into this room, be why? <laughs> anyway, as I was saying, <laughs> is that I know personally, 72 years old, I'm moderately fit, you know, not maybe not, not, not quite as clean living as Joe is, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all right uh, for my age, and I think, you know, Day after day, America's an immense country, and day after day after day of bussing around, having six pancake breakfasts and seven spaghetti dinners, you know, with various volunteer groups and so on, and giving the same gibberish speech over and over again and not quite remembering what part of it I'm in, you know, and where it's supposed to end or, or begin, for that matter, you know. You know, I, I, I'd be dead in a month, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and I fear he may be too, you know. That, 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 Is he your preferred problem. candidate? Well, no, no. I mean, I've been saying for quite a while that the Democrats are, are operating on the premise that, that nobody can lose to Trump, and by God, they're going to find that nobody. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, I don't really have preferred uh, a, a Democratic candidate, but uh, anybody, yes, anybody sane will do. You know, anybody sane and, you know, pretty much has it together and whose ideas aren't completely crackpot and who doesn't want to spend gajillions of dollars. Uh, uh, yeah, any, any sort of regular old Democrat would be, would be fine with me. Well, I, I wish he'd entered the race much earlier because if I were picking to begin with to, the best person to run about against Trump and the, the one candidate that I think Trump would dread most is Michael Bloomberg. Now, he came in awfully late. He's at least going to miss the first three primaries. 
He's not in any of these debates, and there have now been five of them, and that's a huge amount of free publicity. You know, so and, and Mike would be good at that. And he too. would be good, but you know, really he's good. a businessman, but he's a successful businessman. <laughs> but are we clear that and he's, he's not will run? No, we, it's not it's clear. It's not clear that, that he will definitely run. Mike, I mean, he's talking uh, about entering the race at Super Tuesday, I, so missing Iowa, missing New Hampshire. I actually know Mike, I, not, not very, very well, but I know him fairly well, and I've spent a fair amount of time talking to him. He um, put a, I mean, he has people. He has people who really know stuff, people who can count to 11 without taking a sock off, all sorts of really <laughs> smart people. <laughs> he considered getting in in 2016, and he told me that the reason he didn't do it is he put his people on this, and they did all the analysis, and, and, and it seemed that his entrance into the race, as in, in that case as a third-party candidate, would have helped Hillary lose. Yeah. Of course, she managed that on her own, as it turned out. But, but the, 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 besides coming in late with Mike uh, uh, being a problem, is he's, he's, he's also very New York, and he's not as well known. I mean, his business is, he, you know, people think he's a TV station. They don't know he's a person, you know. He's not, <laughs> those of us who lived in New York while he was mayor, and he was a very good mayor, um, 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 we all say, hey, there's the guy, wonderful technocrat, you know, trustworthy, he, he, you know, moderate in his spending, a little, a little bit around the bend on things like giant bottles of soda and so on, you know, uh, uh, but, but, you know, we'll forgive him that easily for cleaning up the streets and cutting down the crime and generally making the place run considerably better than New York had in human memory. We think he, we, we know who he is, we think he's great, but he's not that well known outside the group of people who are New York or New York adjacent or frequent New York visitors. Yeah, but the people we're talking about, right? Those, those people in the middle who are, who are capable of going either way. Mm -hmm. um, well, he'd be great. I they'd think go he'd for appeal. Bloomberg. And I, you I say that they, they don't know him now, but if he became the yeah. nominee, but the they'd problem, know him. The problem is this lateness, you know, and I... And, and I, I it just, may be fatal. I, I, I just fear that Mike's going to do the numbers on this and, 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 and determine, calculate that it is fatal and that, that, that he moved too slow. And, and too given slowly. what you've both said about Joe Biden, is there anyone in that current group, not Mike Bloomberg, who, who might get the nomination? Pete? I mean, Mayor the, Pete from the, Indiana. The Buttigieg story is an interesting one. He seems to be pulling out in front, uh, but only astonishingly. In, but, but only in Iowa and New Hampshire. I mean, yeah. he doesn't poll well with the African American vote at all, for instance, no. which is and, a really and, big problem. And I'm, I'm going to say something controversial. Oh, good. Okay. For once. <laughs> I think one of the reasons he doesn't poll as well as some candidates is not just that he's white, obviously, but I, I think that um, the black community in the United States is more conservative on the LBGTQ front and are less keen on his being gay. And I think there, it is, if we're really talking about nominating him, it's, uh, it would be nice to believe that the United States is not only now pro-gay marriage, but perfectly happy to have a gay president. But it's worth asking the question. Um, and I'm not, not so sure. He was, I, dismissed. he was dismissed in that debate yes. last night as being a local official. And, you know, well, I mean, it's not just that he's gay. It's also that he is a mayor of a tiny town. He's a mayor of the fourth largest city in Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> South Bend, very important place in America until 1963 when the Studebaker plant closed. So, yeah, that's a big problem. But I do think that, I, I mean, I, I, I agree with Lionel. I, I think the gay thing is a little bit of a problem, and it's not a problem we're going to be able to get honest polling about. No, no one's going to Nobody's answer that going question. to answer that question and say, yeah, no, I can't vote for him, you know, because it's just too strange. I mean, I, I don't like that stuff, you know. And nobody's going to say that to a pollster. You know? I, you know, just to lay it on the table, I think there, that people want to 
associate a president with, with strength and power, and there is this little subcon sometimes subconscious association with men, uh, gay men, with weakness. And I think that's a political problem. A Alexander the Great would have begged to differ, but... <laughs> 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 But no, nonetheless, I take your, I mean, you know, just as a man, and it's just one of those things, well, I think Americans have kind of given up telling the truth to any kind of polling outfit anyway, but I mean, that's certainly not a, not a, not a question you're going, you're going to get an honest answer to. Uh, uh, Isn't there also a really big problem at the heart of the, the, the machine of the Democratic Party that they, you know, that their instinct will be to go for Biden? I don't, I don't, the machine is not in control, you know. The machine's and not working. The machine's the, broken. The machine is completely broken. That's yeah. why there's so many candidates. Yeah. I mean, the machine, if the, there were a machine designing this race, no one would have started out with 24 candidates. It's ridiculous. Um, and ever since the Democratic Party gave over to the primary system, it lost control of its ability to, to control the nominee. Let me try and explain this, sir. Sir, you have organized political parties, although that doesn't answer the question of how you got Corbyn. But, and, but and, um, we don't really have organized political parties. What we have, we have, there are 50 different, say for the, you know, for each party, there are 50 different par party organizations, one for each state. In each of those 50, so there are 100 of them. So in each of those 50 states, which has in, each state has innumerable counties, the, the county chairperson for that party, it is the, the group of the county chair people all get together and basically run that state party. So you have these, you have, you have scores of these local uh, uh, county uh, uh, chair people uh, uh, and, and, and the local county chairman uh, for the Republican Party is some guy in polyester plaid pants who's retired from selling aluminum siding. And, 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 the, and, and the chairperson for the Democratic Party in that same county um, is a bitter divorced woman with 40 cats. <laughs> and this is who is running the American political this system. This is the machine. This is the machine. <laughs> Just before we move on to the Republican Party, let's just talk briefly about uh, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders because we, we haven't really got to the, to, to the heart of, of the, the raison d'etre of the Democratic Party. Should it be, in, in order for it to challenge a candidate like Trump, should it be about the prosperity of all Americans or should it be about redistributing wealth, which is the, the kind of top line that Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren uh, put out? Lionel. Well... I mean, I think either uh, Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders would be a catastrophic uh, nominee, and especially Elizabeth Warren is exactly whom Trump wants to run against, right? He would regard this as, you know, Hillary too. And, and I think he could very easily beat her. She's the last person I want to be nominated. And, um, you know, they both... It, they both got similar problems. They're promising free everything. You know that use of free. And they both have this thing going where we want to make America more like Europe. And I go, Europe, great track record since, you know, just a, a, since, you know, uh, Archduke Ferdinand got a flat in Sarajevo. Things have been going <laughs> great in Europe. And make America more like Europe. Where do you even go to get the 90 million dead people, you know, all the Nazis and the commies that it would take to make America like Europe, you know? That's really not the direction we care to go. And apparently isn't the direction you care to go or the, as of the last plebiscite at any rate, but you know, no, uh, it, it can't be done. And Ber Bernie's absolutely out of the question. I'm from that generation. I was a student protester. I was a communist, you know, Maoist, uh, you know, I, uh, so I thought. And uh, <laughs> till I got my first paycheck, <laughs> said federal tax and state tax and local tax and my contribution, my retirement plan and the health, health plan. And, all. And, 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 you know, I netted like I, I was making $150 uh, um, uh, um, uh, every two weeks. I was making $75 a week. And I was so looking forward to that $150 and so was my landlord. And I get my paycheck 
And I netted out like at $82.63 or something. And I said, wait a minute, I'm a communist. You know, I've yelled for communism. I've screamed for communism. I've, I've broken windows for communism. I, 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 I've rioted for communism. And then I get my first paycheck and I find out we have communism already. You just took half my pay. You know, I'm not Rockefeller. <laughs> so that snapped me out of it, you know. And yeah, yeah, he belongs to that era, except that somehow or other he never snapped out of it. Let's, and also, let's, also um, Warren has this notion that you you can you can the entire country can live off of the uh, the proceeds of the top one percent. And this is this is what the left has been selling for some time now. Since that, the, for yeah, a couple of centuries. And that, this yeah. is Corbin does the same thing. Yeah that all you have to do is soak the rich and, and everything will be free for everyone else. And I, it just doesn't add up statistically. It really doesn't, Lana. I actually went and did the math on this. And if you took all of the income of the top 10% of earners in America, if you took all their income, it would fund the federal government for exactly one year. And then the next year when you came back, would that top 10% be there? I don't think so. I think they'd be in the Cayman Islands or someplace and it just wouldn't, you know. Then if you, you say, oh, well, well, you know, wealth is not just what one earns, it's what one's worth. And, and so I did my best to figure out sort of net worth of the top 10% uh, of Americans. If you took all the net worth of the top 10% of Americans it would fund the federal government for not quite the four years that it would take you to get reelected to your second term. And then it's gone. It's gone. You can't go back and get more. You know, and so that is the problem. And there's also, a, I mean, there, there is a philosophical and political question mark over um, the whole idea of a wealth tax. I... I know it's frustrating to see people, some of them not even all that bright or capable, somehow amassing enormous fortunes. But the principle of the government just coming in and taking it because it can. I mean, government does that to a degree already. But this is money that you have somehow miraculously got through the tax system and out the other side and you still have something, and the government says, well, we're gonna punish you for actually keeping anything. It's creepy, all right? Now, I'm not quite sure what the answer is to the inequality situation, and, um, but I find the, uh, the, the idea of the wealth tax disturbing, and it's especially disturbing because you know, there's a long history of uh, Democrats in particular uh, running on platforms that say, you know, they just, they want to tax the millionaires and billionaires. And then when it comes down to designing practicable policy, it pertains to anybody who makes over, you know, $200,000. I mean, it, there's this massive bracket creep so that if you bring in the idea of a wealth tax, you just watch it start to hit anybody who's saved anything. So I, I, I reject I, I suspect it. That, I suspect that the wealth tax appeals to people who are politically engaged but poor. Mm. Well, it, it appeals to anybody. I'm politically engaged and poor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it appealed to me. I mean, interesting little point about, you know, when I was talking about the top 10%, taking everything from the top 10%, is you're probably thinking top 10% in America, well, I have millions a year. $280,000 a year in, 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 in household income puts you in the top 10%. So we're not, talking this, we're not talking about robber barons here. We are talking about people who are living comfortably, but we're not talking about people who are made of money. Okay, let's, let's move on to, to the future of the Republican Party because um, clearly... This is going to be the shortest segment. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, clearly, utterly transformed uh, by the election of, of President Trump. Uh, let's start with you, PJ. What do, what do you think? What do you? Where do you think it stands at the moment? How would you characterize oh, where, where the Republican Party? It's going to destroy the Republican Party. But 
it won't really matter because, as I explained, and uh, the, the party doesn't really exist anyway, so you can't really uh, destroy something that isn't there. I mean, what we have in the United States, rather than political parties in the, in, in the sense that most of the world has political parties, that you join, you carry a card, you can get kicked out of, you pay dues to. Ours are just these uh, big sloppy tendencies. We've got a big sort of sloppy tendency to think, oh, the government should do a little more to help do this, that, and the other thing. And another big sloppy tendency, often present in the same person going, wait a minute, what's that gonna cost, you know? <laughs> and so it's really uh, Venn diagrams. Uh, sometimes there's a great deal, as there was in the 50s, there's a great deal of overlap. Sometimes there's like an 80% overlap. Sometimes, as at the moment, the, 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 the two circles of the Venn diagram barely touch each other. Uh, so the Republicans will go down in flames, as they have many, many times before, and then the Democrats will screw it up, may take four years, may take eight, and the Republicans will pop back up again, and uh, we'll be back at it. How much, though, do you think the Republican Party is even talking or considering the demographic shift that's taking place in America, that increasingly it's becoming non-white in many states, uh, Hispanic-speaking, and so on? To what extent are they even informed by that on a structural none, level? No, no. I mean, in the well, first place, there is no sort of central... This is, this is like a, a starfish or something. It doesn't have a central nervous system with a brain at the middle of it. You know, I mean, it, it's just a, a big blobby thing. So they're not really considering that. And, and, and if an individual Republican does consider the question of America becoming less Caucasian, uh, more diverse, uh, 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 younger, uh, uh, he'll go, ah, oh, they'll grow out of it. You know, I mean, one of these days they'll wake up at 40, realize what their tax bill is, and that they got to send their kids to, to, to private school because the public school stinks, you know, and, and nobody's fixed the potholes. And, it's, and we'll have them, you know, no matter what color they are, no matter what preference they may have or what their last name is. What do you think, Lionel? I mean, I'd, it, well, it, I, I'd, be I'd be surprised if PJ is entirely correct. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of Republicans who, uh, certainly in office, who are watching uh, the nature of their constituencies change, and I bet they're thinking about it, um, although they're not in control of that. You know, there's a cynical side to Democratic uh, enthusiasm for immigration uh, in, in the same way that uh, Tony Blair, you know, opened the floodgates with the presumption that everyone would vote for labor. Um, and, and Democrats make exactly the same presumption. I am hopeful that uh, the Hispanic community will become sufficiently American uh, that their votes become up for grabs. I mean, actually, the cultural tendencies among uh, recent uh, Hispanic immigrants are pretty conservative uh, and e economically conservative. So, yes, they will be uh, potentially uh, open to uh, bread and butter and uh, uh, you know, high taxation issues. Uh, I, I don't think the Demo the Democrats right now are licking their lips. They they watch a state like Virginia turn blue, which is staggering, um, and it's mostly because of Hispanic immigration. But I don't think they I don't think they can count on those votes indefinitely, and I hope they can't because I don't want to live in a one party state. I don't want the United States to um, lose uh, 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 the, the capacity to go back and forth between the Democrats and the Republicans or whatever might replace the Republicans. I think that's an important aspect of having a healthy polity. The, uh, and uh, I don't, tr uh, you know, I, I may technically be a Democrat, but I have a big foot outside and I don't trust that party, uh, especially if you put them fatuously and complacently and indefinitely in power. 
Uh, and what, what could replace the Republican Party then? Oh, no, no, won't be. That's not how the American system works. Is if, if one party like totally goes to pieces, like the old Whig Party or the Federalist Party or something, it just gets a new name and pops up again. I mean, because it is really these two competing tendencies. And I don't want to be without either one of them. I want an honest debate between, because I do think that a good, decent Democrat has got more humanity than a good, decent Republican. I think a good, decent Republican's got a little more common sense than a good, decent, and I want that, I want the argument to be forever ongoing, and I think it's vital to democracy that that argument be forever ongoing between the, the argument for kindness, for fairness, for better justice, and the argument for, wait a minute, that is, hasn't that been tried before and didn't work out, or, you know, gosh, that's going to be awful expensive, or, um, you know, there is, there must be something to be said for the way things have always been done, or we wouldn't have always done them that way. I want that argument to always be ongoing, and in any one party state, be it Republican or Democratic, or, ha what, what, or Green, or what have you, uh, the argument ceases. Yeah, I and mean, one of the reasons that the Republicans have um, uh, essentially self-destructed is that they have abandoned one of their essential purposes in that sense, in that uh, well, they have com completely relinquished any attachment to fiscal probity. Yeah. What is it, do you think, is there, is there a figure inside the Republican Party at the moment that you think could emerge if Trump does win in 2020, who can reinvent or refine those values that you talk about? That you I, I haven't seen him or her or whatever pronoun is preferred. <laughs> <laughs> Have you? No, and uh, you know, you were mentioning this in, in the green room. I, I do find it staggering that a, a country that is now pushing 400 million people comes up with such rubbish candidates. I mean, I, why isn't there someone on the Republican side? Why can't we name five or 10 of them who are waiting in the wings that, um, and, and instead, the, the, especially the, the congressional uh, Republican delegation has, has contaminated itself with Trump in a way that really knocks all of them out. And, and would you say that the main reason that they all support or continue to support Trump is entirely to do with wanting to win again in 2020? Or is it that, they, that there is something about this man that resonates with them individually and collectively as a party? All about power. All about retaining power. And because this is right at the core of politics. I mean, politics is really not a very attractive thing, and it really shouldn't take up a huge space in our lives. I mean, think about how we use the word politics. I mean, you know, are, are office politics ever a good, ever a good thing? Uh, when, when, when we call a, 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 a colleague a real politician, is that a compliment, you know? Um, um, when, when, when we say that somebody got a promotion or a, 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 or a raise by political means, are we complimenting them? Uh, and one reason, I'd like to think one reason that there are so few good American politicians is that there's a strong sense in America that politics is a kind of disgusting field that, 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 that nice people stay out of. <laughs> and yet the impact on everyone's lives is profound. It is. Well, it's, <laughs> it's true. It's, uh, it, and, and I think Trump has furthered the process of, of people of integrity not, um, not wanting to go into that field. Now, that said, I, I, I was impressed um, watching last night's um, Democratic debate last, uh, this, this afternoon. Maybe it's because of tr having watched Trump blither for the last couple of years, or maybe it was having seen the Tory and uh, Labor debate. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> but I found these people quite presentable. I didn't agree with everything they said, but they were cogent, they were civilized, and they knew how to construct an argument. 
And so in some ways I'm, I'm stepping back and I'm countering what I just said because I thought these were pretty decent people who had strong convictions and could string a sentence together. Wow. Which what puts them way to. ahead of the incumbent. But, <laughs> yeah. right. Let, let's, um, let's open up the questions to the floor. Um, yeah. Hello. What do you think of Nikki Haley's chances coming through to revive the Republican Party? I actually wish I'd thought of that, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, now, that, now that you remind me, I might have said maybe, maybe Nikki Haley will be the rallying. Uh, 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 I think pretty good. I mean, she's, 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 um, she, has, she has a good record. Um, she's, has a, uh, she's a very effective politician. Um, she uh, has sort of feeling of kind of strength and positive energy about her. Yeah, she, she could very well. And, she, and she's, you know, by politician age standards, she's quite young too. So there's, you know, she'd be, there'd be time for her to be maybe the phoenix rising from the ashes. I never understood why she resigned. I don't know. To earn money. To earn money. Oh, that. <laughs> earn money. <laughs> yeah. Let's just go here first. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering why the three of you in the time you've been speaking haven't mentioned the role that the state of the economy will play in the next election. Because I heard Frank Luntz, the Republican strategist, make the comment that the last time an incumbent president lost with economic numbers that looked like this was never. Is this election going to be different somehow? I mean, the economy uh, is a certainly helps Trump, although I am not convinced that he can take much credit for it. This is one of those weird, this, this happens all the time, that presidents uh, get credit for good economies and, and then they also get unfairly yeah. uh, get the blame for bad ones. And often, you know, the economy is its own animal and uh, has its ebb and flow and often is um, respond to the degree that government has any effect on it, it's often responding in a delayed fashion. So uh, decisions that Obama made will still be carrying forward and influence the, the atmosphere. Uh, uh, I would give a little different explanation of that. I think the American economy has been bubbling along pretty well for such a long time now that, that, that it's become sort of invisible. When the economy is very volatile, popping up and down constantly, it becomes a, 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 a strong political issue. In this case, it's the candidate and the incumbent who have been popping up and down with great volatility while the American economy has just been sort of steaming along. And I think people have begun to take it a little for granted. But you're right, you're right. We should have discussed that a bit because it is, it is helpful to an, an incumbent, even as odd an incumbent as Trump is, is going to be helped by, 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 by a good economy. I, I wonder about the impact of the trade war with China, though, whether that will come start to make an impact enough to the base that Trump is still, the, the support of his own base, particularly farmers. It'll take a while. Is the, you know, the one thing is there aren't many farmers. I mean, you think of Trump as having this rural base, and he does have a rural base, but most of those people aren't really directly in agriculture or even secondarily in agriculture. The actual number of people employed as farmers in the United States is down around 3%. So, uh, yes, 3% of Americans are going to be clobbered by a trade war with China. It'll be a gradual sort of trickle-down bad effect of, 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 of rising prices of all the Chinese manufactured junk that we love in America. But, but, but it'll go up penny by penny and nickel by nickel. And uh, it will, somebody's going to get really angry about it, but probably not for about two years or three years. Let's go right at the back there, number three. Hello. Uh, in light of the failure of any national politician to unite the country, do you think state power should and could increase? And if so, who would that benefit? You mean federal, federal state power? 
Oh, you mean states? Okay. I'm not a big. I'm not big on uh, state power because it's this. When states have power over things, there are certain. There, there are some states that do dumb things. Um, or evil things. You know. Well, look what's what happening with the abortion legislation. Um, or civil rights, but long before that. Yeah. So, uh, no, I don't think an answer to the current situation is more states' rights. And certainly the entire trend uh, historically uh, in the U.S. is for more and more concentrated federal power. And that's hard to fight. And it, it, it never seems, it's like all power, it, it never seems to go the other direction. Never so comes back down it, to it, us, it, does it? Always you, keeps going you, you up You will to almost them. never see any institution uh, relinquishing power. That's why the EU never gave anything back to the U UK, right? Because once you've got power, you keep it. Uh, number two, just here, and then we'll go to one over there. Hi, it's just a follow-up question on your comments about Harris. Surely it's a good thing that more democratic nominees are making racial justice a central part of their platform. If kind of the election of Trump has shown anything, it's that white supremacy is going strong. I think there's too much focus on racial justice among the uh, primary candidates. Among the it's Democratic, among the Democratic yeah. primary candidates, um, I I just think that at this this point in time, we really need to start using very inclusive rhetoric, because because the country has become so incredibly divided, um, and you know, the last few years, and it's not just Trump, but the last few years, just culturally, the United States has especially on the left, has become consumed with race. So it's not as if, oh, we've never talked about this before. If you take a look at the New York Times, everything is looked at through the prism of race, which is historically astonishing because, I mean, that would have made sense in the 1950s and 60s. But things are really better than they've ever been before in terms of, of uh, equality of opportunity. And yet, and ironically, it's especially white liberals, are now obsessed with it. And I, I think it backfires. And it, you know, this is actually in comparison to minorities who are not nearly as consumed with, with skin color and racial injustice. Um, even approaching things like um, uh, misuse of power by the police and, and you know what? That's not just a black problem. The police are shooting everybody. <laughs> and if you look at the, uh, in fact, the, the, the New York Times did a, a rather, uh, published some rather embarrassed results uh, w during the thick of Black Lives Matter and looked at all of the um, police uh, caused fatalities going back uh, I don't remember how many years, but it was a big section. And they didn't find any racial disparity at all, which is not what they wanted to find. It doesn't, but that doesn't mean that the, the police are, are, are good and um, all of these homicides are justified. It just means that they are abusive of everybody. But, but on the issue of, of white supremacy, I mean, and not is, held accountable, it, 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 isn't it? Isn't it? Um, it's about it's about tone, and it's about how you talk about those arguments. Because it's certainly true that President Trump has emboldened white supremacists to think that it's fine for them to say the things that they say because of his ambivalence on the subject, and that's just being very generous to him. I I believe that the actual number of white supremacists in the United States is still very small. I think that there is a kind of need on the left f for these people, and in some ways they have been, they have been created. They're, the United States has had a fringe movement of racial lunatics forever, okay? 
you know, the KKK, the S, et cetera, but for the most part, in recent times, it has been a tiny number of people. Now, it's true that Trump has emboldened them to become um, more visible and more vocal, but I have not seen any studies that document that there is some kind of huge escalation of actual white supremacy. One of the problems is that the term has become so degraded that we now just use it to mean racist or someone, or, or for that matter, just somebody I don't like. It is, it is illiberally distributed everywhere, but it used to mean something. It used to mean an actual ideology that believed that white people were superior to other races. And the test of a real white supremacist is wh when you call them a white supremacist, they say, hell yeah. And, and They're you, proud of it. I mean, I, I, I'm just, I just want to pursue it just a little bit more because I, I am interested in, in the influence and the, uh, of Steve Bannon. And there's also the, the Southern Law Poverty uh, Group just did this huge um, investigation into Steve Mnuchin and, and the, the emails that he's been sending for years and years. And, and, and it is about sensibility rather than a structural group of people who call themselves white supremacists who march up and down the, the streets of the United States. It, it, it's about... It's about sensibility existing inside the corridors of power, isn't it? Well, let's I mean, thank God for that, because uh, let's, let us always choose disorganized and marginal evil over well-organized evil. You know, we, we, we really don't. And, 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 and to Lionel's point is that um, uh, the, uh, uh, there is an element in the United States of, of, of really repulsive politics. You could hardly have a country of almost 400 million and not have that element. Um, they, 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 but the, our, our Ku Klux Klan, they're morons for the most part. I mean, they're out there and they can't, you know, they can't even... And they, they have such in, poor dress sense. They're in, <laughs> they're in floral sheets, you know, they're in floral sheets with fitted corners, you know, I mean, it's just... <laughs> It's not working for them, yeah. Yeah, it yeah, really let, isn't. Let's, let's take another question. There's a hand just over there. Can we get a microphone to him? Yep. Bearing in mind what um, politicians have been accused of and been getting away with recently, do you think we will ever see a good old-fashioned political scandal ever again? Yeah, it'd be a relief, wouldn't it? Yeah. You know? <laughs> Refreshing. Where's Perfumo when we need him? <laughs> Yeah, bring back John Edwards cheating on his, his cancer-ridden wife. Yeah. That was ordinary politics. And I honestly, I think people are just yearning for... Uh, Good old-fashioned yeah. Chappaquiddick. Yeah, just... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, with, with, with hopes that this time in a smaller car, it'll float for a little longer, she'll get out and everything. An but, electric yeah. car. Electric car. <laughs> Ooh, I don't know if that could work in the water, but and anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah, good question, and wish I wish I knew the answer. Uh, okay, number four. I think we had a microphone Hi. by four, and maybe one um, if we can't see four anywhere. Hi, hi. Oh, you've got mic. Uh, PJ um, Snog Marry Avoid. I think that's a parlor game that you've enjoyed playing in the past. Could you apply that lens to oh. the <laughs> candidate? Uh, what's our language? I think that's the polite pop? name for it. What's, what's our language? Pro policy here. Are well, we supposed I think to this goes out onto a podcast. I think you should probably be as polite. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I <laughs> You're mean, fine. You can, can say what you like. I'm being given permission. They'll, they'll bleep it. They'll bleep it. Yeah. They're, I they're, think you can say whatever you like, okay, TJ. I think and you're and being I given shall. permission. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a way of picking politicians. Was a uh, it was a girls' school game that, that that my wife told me about actually called Kill Fuck Mary. You pick three people. <laughs> you have to do as it says. <laughs> with, 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 pick which. Think the think of the three stooges. Now, which would it be? <laughs> so that you, which do you kill? Which do you marry? Which do you snog? Um, <laughs> It's not actually a very useful analytical tool, as it turns out. No. That's why I'm, I personally am not covering, I refuse to cover the Democratic race until it gets down to three so that I can apply that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number one, All right at the back, and then we'll come here at the front. I think. Hi, um, I'm asking this not as anyone with any particular political affiliation. Um, just so you don't think that it's loaded, but I'm speaking to two fiscal conservatives. So uh, 
I guess the first part of the question is directed at PJ. Uh, when you were talking about having that balance between uh, the important balance between the Democrats and the Republicans, when you were describing the Democrats, you spoke in terms of uh, kindness and generosity. And then when you were speaking about the Republicans, it seems like you went to great pains to avoid the word selfish, and you kind of defaulted common sense. And I wanted to know if you wanted to expand no, on No, I'll that. go right with selfish. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'll go right with selfish, <laughs> cool. you know. It, it just felt I like mean, you were saying, yeah. You know, we, none of us would be here if there weren't an innate sense of self-preservation in the animal world, you know. I mean, it, it's, uh, I mean, it's why we, we, you know, ultimately, it's why we copulate and have, 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 have issue uh, is this desire to perpetuate ourselves, but it's also why we don't stick our head in the oven, you know, and why we don't walk out into the traffic and so on. No, uh, Speak so, for yourself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Selfishness within the bounds of decency and honor is, uh, is, is an important tool uh, to, to human civilization. You want people to be motivated. You want them to seek re rewards. You want, of course, this to be channeled in, in, in some, and that's, of course, but that's society's job. That that's really shouldn't be left to government, let alone politicians, to do that. So. Yeah, I, I totally agree that a successful society, a, a well-organized politics, uh, makes it so that people pursue their rational self-interest, and it also serves th that that the the complexity and the totality of, of those pursuits of self-interest end up also benefiting the whole of society. Your I mean, basic Adam Smith. Right. You know, so, butcher, baker, and beer that's, maker. That's, you know. that's what conservatives traditionally uh, uh, rely on and, and try to arrange, whereas the sappier liberal perspective is, we, why don't we all be good, you know? And, and, and to, to depend on on altruism, uh, or 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 virtue that is that is that is imposed on people, but I'm I'm certainly more a, a, a conservative in that tradition. That I I I prefer. I think we have to not demonize the pursuit of self-interest. Sarah, number one. So on this point of um, the importance of having two strong parties, you both made comments about um, how that gave the benefit of a, you know, a potentially a decent, good conversation on both sides. Is there anything you see in the Republican Party right now that indicates they're capable of that? Or are they suddenly all going to have this miraculous growth of a spine when, when Trump's finally gone, whether that's November next year or four years hence? Well, they have to lose. You know, that's, that, that's the only thing that's going to clean up and clear out the Republican Party. They, they have to lose the White House. They probably have to lose Congress, um, and, I, and I hope they do. Actually, And they I'm certainly will, they will completely destroy themselves if they have another four years of Trump. Yeah. I, mean, I, have this, I have this recurrent image of Donald Trump being hauled out in a straight jacket from the White House by security. <laughs> if we're lucky. <laughs> If we're lucky. Number three, right at the back up there. Um, when Trump's gone, do you see the Republican Party returning to the post-Romney autopsy or going more towards Devin Nunes? Post, so it's, what was the second, second reference went over my head? Yeah, what was the second reference? Devin Nunes. The, well, the, the findings of the, the post-Romney autopsy about reaching out to more of the country and trying to diversify the party or stay more with post-Trump, um, Nunes, Jim oh, Jordan, oh, that I kind see. of branch I, of the party. I, I that's no, no, they'll, 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 if, they, if they get slammed hard enough and they have it coming and, uh, uh, and I expect it, so, uh, they, they, they've lost the House, they, 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 they'll, they'll, they'll lose more seats in the House. It is to be hoped they'll lose the White House. They deserve to lose the Senate. I would personally like to sort of keep the Senate in there to make things sure that things don't go nuts. But right. um, the uh, 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 if, if not if when the Republicans get slammed enough, they will come back as a better sort of people. For one thing, it'll be another generation. 
It'll be people, by the time the Republican Party resuscitates itself, it'll be people who are now in their 30s who will end up running the party, and that will be all to the good, and you will see major changes. I think you're gonna, it, it will emerge as a much more socially liberal, much more intolerant of intolerance, as a, 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 and, uh, and, and I hope more fiscally responsible than it is now. But that may be more of a wish list than an actual set of predictions. So. I think we've got time for one final question. Um, Yes, this session is called the battle for the White House. And most battles are won because of, success, because of a successful strategy or plan. I'm interested to know what each of you would say is your three-point plan. You've asked for pithy questions. I hope it's okay if I ask pithy answers. But your three-point plan for beating him. And in particular, one of the things I'd like to hear is how we communicate beat him in communication terms. It's very easy to dismiss Trump as an idiot, as somebody who's corrupt, but one of the things that he seems to have done, or at least the team around him seems, seems to have done, is to have cut through and communicated to the 51%. How do we beat in communication terms somebody who seems to have uh, an ability to do that? Uh, in the same way that take back control was a, a motto that was irritating for those of us who were on the Remain side of the debate. It captured something, it synthesized something, and it resonated. How do we beat Trump in communication terms, and what is your three-point plan for doing so? Does it have to be numbered? <laughs> you don't ask much. <laughs> um, numbered and in alphabetical order. <laughs> Look, I would just say generally that what the Democrats have to do is to stop living in their little echo chamber and trying to out-liberal each other. The most catastrophic point in uh, the primary campaign came in the first debate when the entire stage full was asked whether or not they would give free health care to illegal immigrants, and they all raised their hands. It was like, yes. I want Trump to have four more years. The, the problem is that Democrats are constantly talking to the far left of the party. Those are the people they're hanging out with. Those are the people who come to their rallies. But these are not the people who are going to make the difference as to whether or not Trump gets four more years. So I would like to see the, the, whoever gets the nomination tack much toward the, more toward the center. Do not uh, promote an open borders policy, uh, which any number of the current uh, candidates are doing, uh, have appreciation f for, for the essentially moderate nature of the average Democratic voter. And I would say that uh, they got to listen. Uh, they have to listen to what, what goes on in ordinary people's lives. I mean, I was talking earlier about people sort of giving the middle finger to Washington by voting for Trump. And the best example of that that I came across when, when I was uh, covering the campaign was I, I got to know and got to like uh, very much this fellow in New Hampshire. Uh, he had a, um, a, a garage, a body shop, and uh, a, a gas station some sort of operation. And he was doing pretty well for himself. And he was a he was a really a, a firm Trump supporter. And I and I, I, I and, and uh, I, you know I, I asked him you know basically why. I said you know do you like the guy? I said I don't like the guy. You know I don't like the guy. I wouldn't want him around. And I said but you know so what's what's going on here? And he said well you know I have I have three uh, uh, gasoline tanks that have been in the ground for too long. They're at the end of their safe existence. They need to be replaced. I can't get the local or the state uh, or the federal permits to pull these tanks out. I can't get the local or the state or the federal permits to put new tanks back in. Uh, he said, our, our business is doing really well. I can afford Obamacare, and I, do, I provide health care for my employees. But he said, it never seems to occur to those guys down in Washington that every time they have a bright idea, 50 pages of 
paper crap land on my desk to be filled out. He said, I don't have a legal department. I don't have a, 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 a health and human services department. I don't have a, a personnel department. It's me and my wife, and I'm a mechanic, you know. And then I've got this junkyard out back, and it's been a junkyard since the 1920s, and now it's got an endangered newt in it, you know. And I said, okay, okay, fine, but how does sending a maniac to Washington fix this? And, he, and that's when he said, that's what they got coming, you know? <laughs> so a little listening to guys like that would be helpful. You know? Well, that was a, a longish but wonderful uh, <laughs> nutshell of, of, of why Trump was voted. Um, I think we should convene again on November the 4th uh, when we know the result of the 2020 election. Um, for now, though, thank you very much, sir, for your question, and thank you all for your questions. And thanks, of course, to PJ O'Rourke and Lionel Shriver. Thanks very much.